starting. Now, um, I was trying to think of uh, what we would use our time doing. We've just recently going, gone through the boot camp. And um, the thing that I get a lot with the people that do come to these meetings is um, some of the, from my perspective anyway, it's it's just how to grapple in the most efficient way with some of the the um, the basic elements of the practice of statistics. And um, I had just encountered a problem with one of our own PhD students who isn't here today. Um, and a, at least one person that's here um, was involved in in this conversation where we had a a rather in-depth discourse about the assumptions of linear models. Uh, and one of them was about the assumption of normality, or if you come to these often, you know, I don't like the the name normality or the normal distribution. I like to call it the Gaussian distribution. And the reason that I have that preference is that um, normal um, implies typical. And for some data, a Gaussian distribution isn't typical. So uh, what we're going to do today is go through an example with some real data. Um, this is very organic, but it, it also is, is really one of the basic elements of statistics that I thought I'd demonstrate um, and, and talk through. And, and I hope we can talk about this in some conversation because there are some elements of subjectivity here. And um, I'll just I'll just say this first and we can revisit it that um, where there's subjectivity about adhering to assumptions or about um, it standards for for practicing, if if you are in doubt about um, making decisions, you probably should should not make any subjective decisions and stick to the the rules. Um, and and that came up in this, and I'll I'll discuss that when it comes up. Now for next week, um, I've recently done a fairly um, ambitious analysis that I'm I'm continuing to do a little bit of work on now. So this is a live analysis that you can dip into that involves random forest, and I'll I'll um, demonstrate that analysis. Some of you might be interested in the actual data. It's a it's a carbon data set for beef production. This is that um, AVP PRISM um, data that I was telling you about, Carl. And, um, and then some of the subsequent analyses leading on from the random forest analysis. Um, so that's next week. And then a couple of weeks for volunteers. I have some people I'm thinking of, but if you have something you'd like to show or you feel like uh, you would benefit from feedback, um, then please do identify yourself. Okay, but for today, if you want to follow along for the um, the normality, you can right click and download as the script, and then you can just click on the data which is in an Excel file, and I should be able to download it. Now, um, before I load up the the um, the data, I thought I would just go over the basic assumptions of um, of regression. It's, uh, some of them are easy to remember and some of them are not so easy for people to remember if they don't think about them a lot. So um, let me change the size of this a little bit. That's probably okay, action. Boop, boop, there we go. So um, assumptions. of linear models, let's just call it regression. Regression is my preferred term for all linear models, whether they're factors or continuous variables. Um, there are actually quite a lot of assumptions for regression, but I'm gonna talk about uh, one of the main four. I'll just refresh you of um, what I think the main four are. Uh, one of them is that there are uh, Gaussian residuals. This is for the general linear model for, for Gaussian data. And then, you know, we've talked about the generalized linear model with all sorts of distributions. But um, for plain old regression, 
we make the assumption of Gaussian residuals. Now, um, I underline the word residuals because um, there, there is this confusion when we're first starting to use statistics. I see it very, very frequently uh, between testing whether your dependent variable, let's say, is Gaussian. Um, just really to put a point on it, I mean, by Gaussian, the normal distribution or um, the bell-shaped curve or whatever you want to call this. Uh, versus the residuals. So is, is it that it's the dependent variable um, or is it that it's the residuals? Well, we make the assumption that it's the residuals. And uh, a picture I like to draw like this is what, what if you had a an ANOVA, which is a form of linear model. To, it's a form of regression. And let's say that you had three, let's just say that you had two um, factor levels in it. And let's say the mean for one of them was approximately like this, and the mean for another one was approximately like this. Well, if we if we took this dependent variable on this y-axis, and we were to make a a histogram of it, and this is a this is what we might expect for Gaussian data. It would look just like that. But for this data, we would not expect the um, the dependent variable to be Gaussian because uh, we would expect a little Gaussian distribution for this one and a little Gaussian distribution for this one. So what what we might actually see is um, is the joint distribution of these two variables that came from different populations and it, and it would look lumpy with with large shoulders um, like um, a lady's jacket from the 80s, and it wouldn't be Gaussian. So this is one of the ones, and we're going to talk about this mostly, but I thought I'd just mention the other the other ones. Is uh, We also make the, the um, assumption of the equality of variance. But if you want the fun name for it, it's homoscedasticity. I pronounce this homoscedasticity with a hard C. There's actually an academic paper that teaches us how to pronounce it pro, um, correctly like that. What this is, the way we test it and what we look for, is um, we look at the residuals as a function of the fitted values. The fitted values is kind of like a jargon way of saying the predictor variable values along this axis. And uh, we know the residuals should have a mean of zero. And let's, let's say that there are some numbers here. One, two, three. What we're looking for is that our residual values are nice and evenly distributed, have about the same range all along this range of fitted values. Now, we, we almost never see it perfectly because of sampling error, but um, like one weird thing that I look for um, that I don't like is uh, if, if one side of the residuals is a lot higher in range than the other side. Let's say that some of the residuals went to two and some of them went to four up here. That would be a skewed residuals. So that's a, that's a no-brainer um, for the the skew, but for the assumption or for the um, assumption of um, Gaussian residuals, but for homoscedasticity, what we're mainly looking for is that um, the there's a straight line across both of the edges of the residuals, as opposed to something like this, which would might be cone shaped, um, which is a problem. I call this problem the cone of terror. I don't know if there's a jargon term for it. I wish I did know. So I would use it like crazy. All right, there are two other assumptions I'm not going to draw pictures of. One of, uh, one of them, the third one, let's say, is uh, the independence of data points. If we don't have independence of um, points, we have to do something with it. Often, and as a matter of fact, the data I'm going to show you today 
lacks independence of points. And uh, one common way to, to address that that we've talked about a lot in these meetings is um, mixed effects models. So uh, I'll show you a, a mixed effects models solution. And in, in this case, it doesn't work with the data. And so an option, I'll show you another option to um, avoid a mixed effects model and to fix some other assumptions in this particular data set. And then the last one is um, a linear relationship as opposed to a nonlinear relationship. And um, I'm not going to talk very much about these. I'm going to focus on the Gaussian residuals today. So if you want to follow along, the links are up here, as I pointed out. And I've already got them open here. It's going to make the um, size a bit bigger for people who like to follow along. I'm going to go ahead and set um, in a sloppy way my working directory to my source file location. So I downloaded these two files and just put them in the same, same directory like this. I'm going to load a couple of libraries. <laughs> if, you, if you are going to take notes and use something like this for the future, um, some of the things I'm about to show you in this script are things I do for almost every single linear model analysis I ever do, including these libraries. So uh, most of you know by now that um, I prefer to store regular data that aren't too big or aren't um, special kinds of data in Excel, in an Excel format. And I, I prefer to have um, the minimum number of tabs possible, and I prefer to have um, a data dictionary. Now, I didn't prepare a data dictionary for this data. Let's just look at it real quick. This has four um, columns, make it a little bit easier to see, make it a little bit bigger. This is, uh, this is looking at um, a dietary supplement for sheep, for sheep nutrition. And the dependent variable is a, um, the concentration by some measure the units don't really matter. I'm somewhat anonymized this. Um, this is a field trial that's done by a nutrition company, but um, you know, so I won't give any details about what the treatments are or anything like that. But uh, this is a measure of um, liver copper. There are two time points. I'll just call them zero and one. There are three treatments. One of it is a negative control. That's this. NTX, and then as we'll see, there are two other ones. One is a standard, um, a standard food additive, and one is a is one that is being tested. And the expectation is that the um, concentration of liver copper will be um, higher when there's the presence of uh, either one of the the supplements. And um, I think the clients were. We're hoping and expecting that the the new product was similar, not very different to the um, to the standard. There are three farms invo involved in this, and uh, I think there are um, I think there are 135 individual sheep, each of which has been measured twice. Okay, so that's just a little bit about the experiment and the data. And um, maybe maybe just to put a finer point on it before we go. Uh, with data like this, the, the kind of prediction is that uh, we have a control. It's, you know, it's called NTX. That doesn't really matter too much for our exploration of the data. And the um, two treatments, we'll call them T1 and T2, they're coded as something different than those. But the, the expectation is that we we do have a significant difference between between these, and uh, that we also have a significant difference between these two, but that there's not really any significant difference between the two treatments. That's what we expect. Furthermore, we've got three different farms, and um, 
some of you have heard me refer to the what I call the the gem conundrum, genotype by environment by management. So for the study that is the um, the company that is, have motivated this study, they're not interested in the differences between farms. They want they want this pattern to be manifest for any old farm. And so they've, they've sampled several farms to try to emulate the range of um, variation they might they might observe due to the gym conundrum. Three farms, is that enough farms to do that? I, I don't know, it probably not. Um, but they want to have randomly sampled those farms. And uh, the reason I wanted to say it in that specific way is that for, the, for this particular problem, the variation due to the farms is annoying variation. The company doesn't really care about the variation due to the farms. And uh, we can get rid of it with a, by treating farm um, as, a, as a, a random effect. However, the client, uh, I think they requested to treat, to treat it as a fixed effect. So they wanted to actually measure the difference between farms. So we'll, we'll look at that. I'll remind myself when we get to the script about how <clears throat> that was handled. So now back to the libraries. Um, almost every one of my data sets, uh, every one of my analyses has um, has open XLSX, my preferred Excel reading library. If I'm going to use mixed effects models, I use LMER capital T test. Just in passing, I've, I've said some of this to you, some of you who are here recently that, um, and I'm not going to spent a lot of time today talking about it in this session, but um, for mixed effects models, there is a rising sentiment. It's been rising for quite a long time, and, and actually it's a mature sentiment amongst the statisticians that um, there's widespread use and abuse of the interpretation of p-values by um, non statistician scientists, applied scientists, like like everybody who's not a statistician. And um, the, the most popular tool uh, that I know of, the most effective tool, with the most modern methods, the, and, and the best methods in terms of accuracy and estimation of um, maximum likelihood and so forth, is one called LME4. It's a standard um, it's a standard package in R. It's been around for a long time, and famous statisticians have built this for their own research, and they've shared it with the world. And most people use it in papers. Um, but those people that developed the LME4 package um, are a little bit activist statisticians, and that they decided that not only do they observe widespread um, p-value abuse, but they view it their responsibility to do something about it. So in their very popular library, this was some years back, it was actually quite controversial about 10 years ago, they decided to remove the, the default calculation of the p-value from their, from their package. And um, they reasoned that, that it was quite, it's quite easy, um, depending on your viewpoint, to calculate your own p-value given other outputs from a mixed effects linear model. And they reasoned that if you also thought it was easy, then you probably um, could be trusted if you could calculate your own p-value to interpret it correctly. But if you couldn't calculate it yourself, you probably shouldn't be trusted anyway. And instead, what they want scientists to do is to stop using the p-value and only look at the coefficients, the slope of a regression, um, for example, and the error around that slope and, and interpret your models only with the um, estimate and the error. I'm digressing a little bit by saying that um, somebody came after that and made a new library that implements all of the mixed effects models calculations, but also give you back your p-values. And that's the one that I typically use day to day. 
because I don't want to go the extra step of calculating my own p-values, and and you should probably shouldn't either. So this this one has pretty much replaced the functionality of the bleeding edge LME4. So LMER test is the one that you should always use, probably, if you're doing a mixed effects model. And then VisReg. Um, this is something else I'm not going to go through today, but um, if I if you have a simple linear regression and you plot the raw data, you're able to visualize effectively exactly what the model is calculating with respect to that predictor variable and the dependent variable. However, if you have a model, a linear model that's got more than one variable, if you make univariate plots um, where you only make one predictor, like predictor A, and the dependent variable, and you make a separate plot that's predictor B with a um, with a dependent variable. You run the risk of misrepresenting the statistical results if you if you do an analysis with a linear model that has both A and B. I'm not going to digress a lot on this. I'm just going to say verbally that um, because of that problem, um, a, a way around it is to view the marginal effects of univariate plots. And univariate plots are needed to interpret uh, linear models that have more than one predictor. Uh, a way to get around that problem of bias, where you have correlated variables, for example, uh, is to use a package like VisReg that, that automatically and simply um, calculates your marginal effects. And I, I recommend doing this even with simple models. It's a real simple tool for diagnostics. So I, I use it religiously for diagnostics, but I, I wouldn't, for example, use it to make um, publication ready graphs necessarily, although you can do that too. All right, so having said all that, I'm just going to read in the data. It's going to pop up here in the global environment. There should be um, 135 sheep. So um, it's two time points. So there should be 270 rows of data from memory. And I believe there are four variables. So we should see a data object with those dimensions pop up in the global environment. Three, two, one. It's five variables, 270 observations. But just take a peek like we should. We can see that things look like they've read in correctly. <clears throat> Liver copper is a numeric variable. Time um, is read in as a numeric variable. Um, probably want to do something about that if we were going to uh, measure a time difference between them. Uh, turn it into a factor, for example. Uh, farm is a character which will be converted to a, a factor by, by R. Uh, the treatment is a character which will be converted to a factor by R. And the individual sheep ID is a character, which also will be handled as a factor for most linear model operations. So we, we don't really have to do anything to the data, which is convenient. Um, I would always start off, even though when I, what I just said, uh, that I would usually look at marginal effects uh, for a model, you should always really start off with some exploratory data analysis looking at the univariate effects. So I wanted to ask, how different are the farms? with respect to liver copper. What, what we probably want to see is that they're all about the same. Are they? Three, two, one. Well, well, well. Um, instantly, we have some things to think about and and uh, worry about for this analysis. You know, like one thing is that um, the median values for these are pretty different, let's say. But another thing that I'm I'm concerned about is the variation. Remember box plots. The uh, box part of the box plot that's shaded here is the inter 50% quartiles. It's 50 the middle 50% of the data, um, and we can see that the the range of the variables and the middle 50% for the Melrose Farm is huge, and it's much smaller. For Lake Taylor, and, uh, and it's in the middle for Northcote. Another thing I observe is that um, there are outliers. 
for uh, both of the um, outside farms here and that the range is very big. And so I know without even plotting it, although we will plot it in just a moment, that the dependent variable is very skewed. Remember, we don't make the assumption about, about, um, about the dependent variable itself, the raw dependent variable having a Gaussian distribution. And yet, <clears throat> if it's very skewed like this data appears to be, that can influence the, the distribution of the residuals like, like it does in this case. So let's look at that. A way to get a, uh, around this skew, well, before we do that, let's look at the treatment, three, two, one. The thing we see with the treatment is the same thing um, for the farms, that the variances appear to be different. Overall, this is all the farms together for the control. Um, this seems to have a smaller range and some outliers. And then the distribution seems to be very similar for the two treatments, the, um, the standard treatment and the, the new treatment. Okay, so um, well, one of the things we should just try is whether transformation, some simple transformation will, um, will improve the shape of the data. So let's look at a log. This is a natural log um, transformation for the farm data, three, two, one. Instantly, it looks a lot better. And uh, I almost wouldn't consider doing any other analysis at this point. We could have tried log base 10. Uh, hold on just a moment. Someone knocked, but they've gone away. Um, we could have tried log base 10 instead of natural log. We could have tried square root. Tend to use um, uh, different transformations for, for different shapes of skew, but um, if if you haven't had the experience to do a lot of transformations, I just suggest starting with um, with a log, log base 10. If you have very extreme right-tailed skew, this is not that extreme, but we can use the inverse, divide the values by, uh, but divide one by the values. <clears throat> that is effective for really extreme skew. But in this case, uh, for the farms, Plain old natural log works. Let's look at the treatments. And wow, look at that. That's a lot better too. Now, a thing that we often want to do is, um, and I've done this with um, a lot of you in here for different data sets, is um, if you've got a situation for ANOVA where you've got um, two factors plus a numeric dependent variable, then uh, a perfect kind of plot to do diagnostics is something called the interaction plot. Sometimes you see these in publications, but it's a staple in, in the diagnostic toolbox we're doing a two-way ANOVA where you have two factors as predictors. The way this works is you have um, factor one down on the x-axis. You have your, your dependent variable over here. And factor two um, you would use to have different lines. So here I've drawn factor two a as a solid line and B as a dotted line. And here we would have factor one A and B. But we have three levels to our factors, but the, the kind of thing you're looking for here, I'm just gonna draw it simply, is um, if you have uh, no effect of factor one, but a big effect of factor two, might see something like this. If you have a um, big effect of um, factor one, this shows no effect because the mean effect, the average effect for each of these is not different from one another. 
But if you if you did have an effect of factor one, let's say you had a, an effect of factor one and factor two, you might see lines that look like this. So this shows a mean difference along the x-axis and the separation of the lines here. And if you were looking for an interaction effect, you might see something like this, where the um, the lines are not parallel. This is why we use this interaction plot to uh, diagnose before an analysis what we see here. It's a little peculiarity to, to do the interaction plot. We use the um, interaction.plot function and bring up the help and you can read all the variables, but essentially you name the X factor variable, the trace factor variable or the different lines and the response um, variable, the dependent variable. There's a little peculiarity of it in that each of these dots represents the mean. In this case, it's the mean of, um, for the dotted line, it's factor 2b and factor 1a. So the variables that are the, that combination of factor levels for the two variables, it calculates the mean. And if you've ever played around with the mean function in R by default, um, if there's any missing data, it drops, it drops the data. So if I just run the interaction plot, it's going to look really funny. I'll, I'll indulge myself. Maybe it won't be funny at all to you, but um, it will look really funny. Oops. <clears throat> I'm not going to be able to demonstrate it without um, doing this little step because I made a new variable. I forgot that. What I've done here is I've used the complete cases function on the data variable. I'll just show you why I did that. If I do a table of the complete cases on data, what we'll see is we have um, seven rows that are not complete cases. In other words, seven rows with missing data. So if I run and, and use complete cases on the, the data object, I make a new data object without any missing data. So I've done that first, and then I'll make the interaction plot. It's not very pretty. You can change the aesthetics of where the legend are and stuff like that, but I usually don't bother to do that because I use this for diagnostic reasons. What this graph is really effective of doing, remember this is the mean of the log of liver copper. These are the three treatments. These are the three farms. And what you can really, really clearly see is the big spread between the three different farms. Farms really important in explaining variation. And also for every one of the farms, more or less, we get the predicted pattern of uh, the copper measure for the control being low, and then it goes up, and there's not much difference between the two treatments. Up, not too much difference between the treatments. Up, not much difference. The degree to which they go up is different. So there are fairly subtle things going on here. A thing I promised to do is we'll look at the skew of the raw data. Um, three, two, one, this is a histogram of the dependent variable. Massively skewed. If we apply a log transformation to it, um, it does balance it out somewhat. And um, this is, this is pretty close to being Gaussian, or it's, at least it's a lot closer to being Gaussian. Where it diverges a lot is uh, is here and over here. So there are a lot more values um, at these intermediate left values of liver copper and the intermediate right values, then there should be. Those, those shoulders should go down and be shaped like a bell. That's probably because of what's going on in the data, even with the log, that there are big differences. And I uh, drew a picture of, of that effect, and I made a remark about ladies' garments in the 80s when I drew this picture. And uh, we see a lumpy distribution and uh, that more or less is why we see that. This is the kind of thing that um, 
when you work with data, you, you it becomes obvious to you what's going on. But it's something that I'd encourage you to get comfortable thinking about and and doing. So I did two analyses on this um, this data, and a lot um, make this a little smaller momentarily so we can see the whole formula here. Maybe I'll um, just do that and go back in. So what I've done here is I've used the LMER function. This is the linear mixed effects in R function. This version of it is in the LMER test library, but the syntax is exactly the same for the most popular one where the statisticians took your fee value. So uh, that's real convenient. You can you can uh, keep the same syntax and um, the same scripts and use that um, more kind and gentle library that gives you your p-values back. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. I have a little note to myself to remind people of the principal assumptions of linear models, which I've already done. Um, I'm going to go ahead and calculate this. This is log liver copper as a function of farm and treatment. Now, uh, the clients said they wanted the fixed effect of our, of the farm. I, I would I would view that as an annoying thing, and I would advise them to get rid of it, but that's not what they asked for, uh, and their treatment. And here I'm using as a random effect the, um, the effect of sheep ID. Remember, every sheep was measured twice. We have time at the end. I don't know if we will have time. But a, a diagnostic graph I didn't make, but would be highly appropriate for this particular data set, is a typical one. It, it, this fits the case where there's repeated measures. And uh, it's, it's easiest. This works best when there's exactly two. Um, But it, it can work for more. And um, it's a it's an old fashioned kind of graph that uh, you would see a lot, at least. Um, oh, at least in my younger days, you don't see them very often these days, but um, they're, they're a type of interaction plot like I showed you and uh, you'd have time down here. Uh, time one and time two, you'd have your dependent variable over here. And um, you'd have the first measure and the second measure. And so you'd have a bunch of lines connecting the, the two time periods. And what you'd be looking at for a graph like this is uh, whether all the lines are parallel or there's lots and lots of crossing. If there's lots of crossing then uh, there, there's not liable to be much effect of the difference between time. If they all go down or if they all go up, there'll be a strong effect of time. <clears throat> okay, so here, you know, we're interested in um, whether the application of one of those treatments has affected liver copper. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this model. Whoops, I've got to um, load my libraries first. And I'm going to run that model. I'm going to, before I do anything, before I even look at the summary and go through it, I'm going to plot the linear model object that I made. If you use plot on the, the standard R plot function, we use it on a linear model object for a mixed effects model. It shows um, shows this graph by default. It shows the residuals as a function of fitted values. So let's look at that. I'm going to draw it out so we can see some of the details here. Now, um, one of the things that you might notice 
is that the zero is not exactly in the middle of this. So here on this lower axis, we can see a negative two and a negative one. And the top part um, goes to positive one, but it doesn't quite go as far. So one of the things that we observe here is that uh, we, we don't have perfect symmetry. Another thing that's a, a big, it, I'd say it's a big, it's not a big, it's a, it's a moderate warm, warning flag. It is a warning flag, makes me cautious, is that uh, what I want to see is an even spread of these residuals all along that line. Um, but what I see is a gap up here, and I see a gap down here, in addition to the lack of symmetry. And all, also, I sort of feel like if I, if I, I hope you can see my cursor. If I circle this region of this graph, it looks to me a bit like there's a pattern. And we don't want to see any patterns. We want to see a random array of the residuals here. Now, these are subtle things that uh, I've looked at a very large number of these graphs. They're, they're subtle things that um, I can pick out because I have looked at a lot of these graphs. Um, but it's not so cut and dried. I, I, even I am not positive that I would, I would chuck, chuck out these residuals and say, yeah, this, this doesn't fit the model to my liking well enough for me to be comfortable to report this full stats. So we need to do a little bit more work. Before, before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and look at a summary of the model. This is a mixed effects model. I'll make that wider and run that again. <clears throat> Now, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of it, and I just want to show you all of it first. It's quite a lot of stuff, but ignore almost all of it. Uh, let's start with this part. This is a part that um, applied scientists don't often report, but it, it's a part that I like to look at, and I like to discuss it with um, with uh, applied scientists um, if I'm helping them with an analysis and explain why I think this is interesting. What we have over here is is the random effects part of the model. And uh, we can, from this output, we can um, can actually calculate a, a descriptive statistic, which I which I wish was widely reported, but it isn't it isn't actually widely reported very much. I wish it was widely reported because I think it tells you a lot about your data set and helps you interpret it. Specifically, what we're paying attention to is um, our our random effect over here, which in this case is the individual sheep. And what the um, we want to compare that to the to the total residual variation, which is um, all the variation that's left over after we account for variation due to that random effect. And um, I love the way that the LMER test library formats this. It's a little bit different than some of the other ones. It makes it easy to do this calculation. What we want to look at is the variance. Now, the total variance in your data set are these two numbers, if you add them up. If you have more random effects, there would be more rows on this table. So if we add um, this all up, it, you know, it's around 100 and uh, one point one three or something like that so the the variance depends on the scale of your dependent variable and it's it's not really the important part of this the important part of this is the proportion of the total variance that is attributed to your random effect so in this case it's 0.23 divided by 1.13 so you know around 20 percent that's not a huge amount but that's a good proportion, and I, I wish that proportion of variance was reported every time a, a random effects model is run. Um, before I digress, because I am liable to digress on this and talk about the random effects more, let's just have a peek at the summary table. Now, um, we've talked about a lot in here how the summary function for a linear model in R is a 
is not an ANOVA table with main effects for factors. Instead, it reports a contrast table. And uh, what a contrast table is and how it differs from an ANOVA table is that we would get an effect and, and an estimate of the effect for each factor relative to a baseline level of that factor. Now, this is some applied scientists don't want this, um, but we would always run the summary function in R to um, to examine the the contrast table if we're interested in differences between factor levels. In this case, we are. And uh, if I just look back at one of my plots before we um, unpack this, if I look at this farm plot that I did, one of the things that the clients are interested in is whether um, the farms are different. So, for example, whether these are in alphabetical order, so arbitrary order. And we can choose the order of these. You can specify the order. But uh, what the what the contrast table does is it takes a baseline variable that you specify. And if you don't specify, it takes the alphanumeric first one. So uh, in this case, it's going to take Lake Taylor and it's going to compare it to Melrose. And then it's going to compare Northcote to Lake Taylor. So if we just look at that, um, we see a comparison of Melrose to Lake Taylor, and it's highly significant. And the estimate is um, 0.93 with an error of 0.17. And uh, what that means is that um, we expect on average that the liver copper is going to be log liver copper, that is. It's going to be almost one unit higher in Melrose than in Lake Taylor. And likewise for Northcott, um, it's 0.6 higher and it's highly significant. We get one for the treatments as well. If I just look at the treatments and spread that out just a little bit. I can't quite get the whole table. Yeah, the table goes in there. Remember, this is the control. You often want the control to be the first baseline variable. In this case, it, it is alphanumerically the first one, which is just lucky. So if we compare plus to the control, it's significant and plus is 0.52 higher and the treatment um, SMT is 0.44 higher and significant. Okay, so that's how we interpret this table fully. A lot of scientists would just want the ANOVA table, which um, is used, we use the ANOVA function. And uh, we see the overall effect of farm highly significant in the treatments. Now, a um, thing I haven't shown you yet is to testing the assumption of residuals. How do we do that? Even though I already examined the residuals of the dependent variable, and I'll just emphasize this one more time, um, that's not an assumption we make that the dependent variables are, are Gaussian. We, we make the assumption that the residuals of the model are Gaussian. And the standard output for every software, it's even easy to calculate in Excel, even for multivariate models with um, the stats plugins enabled, is to, to calculate the residuals. So there's no excuse not to test this. It's one of the easiest ones if you're in, if you're in doubt. So the way we do it in R is we take our linear model object. Um, and if we just print the linear model object, we get a a group of the estimates. We tend not to even look at this. It's just a summary of what the model is. If we wrap that in the residuals argument, we get the actual residual calculations. And remember, these are as a result of both of the predictor variables, or all of them, if you have a unanimous, a bigger model with lots of predictors. And that what our assumption is, is that, that these values are Gaussian. And they, they're the ones that we've already looked at on that plot. So let's look at a histogram of these residuals. They look very different than the um, the Betty Davis shoulders um, graph of the raw data. And remember, these are log transformed um, dependent variable. And uh, essentially what we can see is that there, there is a somewhat symmetrical, symmetrical um, arrangement, but at zero, you know, the, what are the basic 
attributes of the Gaussian? Well, the largest number of points are around zero. And what we see here is that that's not true. There's a skew. The, the largest amount of points are, you know, a little bit more than 0.5. And uh, we also want the um, symmetry. Uh, we can see that there, there is not good symmetry. There are five bars in the left direction and only four bars in the right direction. Uh, and, and what's worse is that um, we don't see a bell-shaped curve um, this way. There's, there's more than there would be taking the center point for Gaussian, and we certainly don't see it in this way. There's a lot more here, and then it falls right down. So there's less here and a lot more here. So we know that's going to fail a test of, um, of whether or not this is normally distributed or Gaussian. The way we test it is we're testing on the residuals, and um, there are lots of tests. There are visual tests. This is, just the histogram itself is a visual test. This does not look Gaussian to me, but let's go ahead and do a statistical test. I'm going to choose the Shapiro um, test, Shapiro.test in R. And sure enough, we see that the p-value is very small. What we have to keep in mind what we're testing here. The hypothesis here is that um, the null hypothesis is there's no difference between your residuals and Gaussian. And here we reject the null. So there's a big difference, you know. So all things considered, um, our analysis there was not right. Well, um, this has taken more time to go through than I thought it would. But I want to show you now quickly, we've gone through all that. Uh, one of the solutions for this. We have a couple of options. Um, we're in a situation where our residuals are non-Gaussian. We've already done a transformation. That's one of the first things you can do. Already tried transformation. Um, we could try different transformations. What I haven't shown you is that I did try a whole bunch of them, a whole bunch of the simplest ones. We could resort to a generalized linear model. If we could find um, a distribution that would fit. That is not so easy for data like this that we we assume would be normal or log normal, and uh, they're just a bit weird skewed data. So th this is not really this is not really viable for us. Um, another option is to use non-parametric regression. So Kruskal Wallace. Um, would be an option. That is an option here. Uh, maybe it's an option that um, the clients could accept, but they had very specific guidelines. So the option, another option, is to be a little more creative. This isn't complicated creativity, it's simple creativity. What I reasoned is that we have times one and times two. And what we're really interested in is, is the pattern of differences between those times. And I reason that, you know, actually we can make a new dependent variable by subtracting time two, uh, subtracting time one from time two. And then we'd have a difference value with the expectation that that it might be more likely to be Gaussian. And this would also simplify the model. We could do away with the um, random effect. And uh, that's actually what I did. Um, I first selected the, I'll just show you the, it's happening up here in the global environment. And I first selected the first 135 rows of the data and just the first four columns because um, the fifth column is the time so this is time zero or time one. 
and I've uh, I've changed the names. I don't know why I did this is to make it a little simpler uh, for me. So now we've got this um, data two that's got three names, uh, the four names that I've just renamed. One, one is called the copper rather than time one and time two. That's why I changed the names. And then I've picked the uh, liver copper from the second half of the data set and I've added it. Um, I've added it um, to this data set as copper two. So that's going to pop up here as copper two, three, two, one. And then I'm simply going to take the difference and create a new variable called diff that takes the difference between copper two and copper one. And that'll pop up right here, three, two, one. Um, it doesn't like this. These error messages are because it doesn't like me squashing the um, the figure down there because I have the font very big, so it's easy for you to see. If I look at um, which ones are negative, I find that there actually are some values that are negative. So where some values went down, where we expect them to go up, but I didn't worry myself about that too much. Um, <clears throat> So what I um, what I've done here is just done a plain old regression with the diff as a function of farm and treatment with my new data. I'm going to calculate the linear model three two one. This is not a mixed effects model. I'm going to look at the summary three two one. So you just put it in last. Mm. Um, thing we see is that uh, about. 50% of the variance is explained. And uh, if I just run that again so that we can see all the results, doesn't like that, that graph state. Um, what we can see is that, um, that we have qualitatively similar results. And if we just look at the ANOVA, we have qualitatively similar results where farm and treatment are highly significant. And if I just um, now do a histogram of the residuals, for this model, they're still not perfectly Gaussian, but they're much better than they were before. And if we do Shapiro test, um, p value is greater than 0.05, and so that's not different to Gaussian. And if we just make a box plot of the, the diff, you see the univariate effects and of the treatments. And uh, then finally, an interaction plot. It's qualitatively sim similar, but um, what we get out of this is a fully reportable set of stats that uh, any reviewer could accept. And also the predictions, even at the ranges of copper, will be accurate, whereas for the first model, they wouldn't have been accurate. And if we just look at um, what VizReg will do for us, so it's just a diagnostic graph. This is VizReg's version of the um, of the uh, interaction plot. I wanted to show this because this is such a, a powerful um, package. Is that it? It shows that at every farm, there's just this big difference. And a thing that I like is that by default, um, it shows the actual data, and we can see there's actually some skew even in the diff. Uh, but now we can we can evaluate that for ourselves. And uh, these these are the marginal values. They're not box plots. Um, so we have a, a full view of the data. We're out of time. That's what I wanted to show everyone. Hope that was interesting. Are there any comments or questions? I'm going to go ahead and turn off the video. Um, I've got a quick question. on. Um, 